Set up what you work from or use a computer monitor. Don't use a print, there's just not enough information there. I begin my painting by a series of very bold marks. This is absolutely not a drawing. Um, it's more like a placement or a scaffolding to build your painting on. A drawing is a series of line, whereas painting, it's overlapping tone value, creating edges, not line. Everyone always wonders why you build a value structure under a painting. It makes such a huge difference as to what those colors look like in the end. You don't have to put the paint on that thick and you have so much more control. I did add these leaves on. I felt like we needed it. I'm just finalizing now the underpainting. The underpainting does not have to be really tight. In fact, it can be quite rough. You're just after the values. All right, now the fun part begins, the color. Red, orange, yellow, violet, blue, and green. That's all God gave us, and that's all I'm putting on my palette. There's no such thing as chartreuse or brown or tan or pink. Those are all fancy terms for red, orange, yellow, violet, blue, or green. It looks like I'm adding a lot more to my palette than that, but there are darker and duller versions of yellow, orange, and red. And then I'm adding um, very dark, intense versions of violet, blue, and green. That's very helpful when you add white to an intense dark version, you can get a whole range of intense color. And what I mean by intense color is clean color, color that is not grayed. You can always gray a color by adding its opposite or black, but you can't always intensify a color, so you want to start off with the intense colors. Okay, now I'm glazing. Um, which is oil paint added to a medium. It's very thin. I don't always use glazing, but it helps me out in the painting process. It helps with the color. It also helps the paint um, glide on easier. Um, and now I'm actually adding white to my paint. So it's the beginning of a painterly look the paint uh, begins to get thicker now. When you're oil painting, you always start off very thin and then you move to thick. So the lighter you get, the thicker it gets. Okay, I'm constantly playing opposite colors against each other. That's what nature does. I try to paint it with a full spectrum. So I'm trying to slip in opposite colors wherever I can get away with it. Um, in this case, on the shadow that's on the wall here, I'm, I've added a blue-violet to my paint because the wall is actually a dull uh, version of a yellow, yellowish-orange color. And here we've got uh, burnt sienna or raw sienna mixed with a little bit of blue for that shadow and then a brighter, intense version on the light side. And then because of reflections, you can go back in those shadows and warm them up a little bit, leaving the edges, though, still cool. Okay, now I'm doing the same thing on the apple. Um, I've got a dark red now mixed with a little bit of green for that shadow. If you were to come in with brown, on that shadow area, uh, and that's what a lot of people do because brown is dark, um, it, it would look very unnatural. Okay, now I'm coming in with glazing. You can do that if the painting is absolutely dry. And now highlight. Such an important tone value, it makes such a huge difference to the dimensionality of a painting. Um, and then the reflection. There's five tone values. Body tone, body shadow, cast shadow, highlight, and reflection. The edge of this pumpkin is much too sharp. I'm gonna soften it by 
cross hatching. Um, the paint being wet on both sides, I can just make teeth. When the edge is soft, it will recede. Now you can see the teeth mark that I made. And now I just have to come in with a damp, clean brush, slightly damp, clean brush, and then just feather that in. So you can see here where it was much too sharp. And then after it's feathered down, you can see how it just recedes, how it goes back into space. Okay, now the background is getting its lightest lights and it's darkest dark. You can see how I warmed up the inside of that shadow on the wall. Look how that sharp leaf against that receded edge of the pumpkin just pops out. See how that sharp edge comes forward? Whereas that pumpkin edge it just goes way back. I'm going to keep these leaves colorful but not as colorful as the pumpkin or apple or corn. Um, they aren't as important. They aren't in the focal point area. Same on this side. I'm just keeping these leaves in the background very vague. Okay, working with overlapping now, we've got the green area and then the dark part of the stem overlapped by the light part of the stem. And then cut down with a damp, a damp brush. I can get away with that because the apple was completely dry. Okay, watch close here. We got glazing, opaque paint, and then overlap. Overlapping is so important in painting. Work from back to front when you can. Okay, so since this corn is completely dry, I've used glazes. And then I can come in on top of that with highlights. It's kind of hard to tell here, but I'm not using a small pointy brush. That's actually a larger brush. I've just got it turned sideways, but it's much better to use a larger brush on the corner for your highlights than using a small pointy brush. Okay, now the table is gonna get its lightest lights. In oil painting, you work from lean to fat or thin to thick. Um, white is thicker, so as you lighten things up, it gets thicker. On the wall, the pumpkin, the apple, the table, they all got their lightest lights last. Okay, I'm signing it now. I hope I was able to help you out today. Please rate and subscribe. Thank you.